Hello, and welcome to season three of Scaling Success, a podcast geared towards entrepreneurs and investment professionals, where we discuss a range of topics that contribute to building a valuable and long-lasting business. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe on Spotify and or YouTube. Welcome Peter Jennings as today's guest on the pod. I'm thrilled for today's conversation. Peter actually represents a first in the Scaling Success podcast history. Peter is a former Volition Capital employee. Uh, Peter is a 2012 graduate of Middlebury College. His first professional experience post-college was at the investment bank, AGC Partners in Boston. He then joined Volition as an analyst where he was researching new industries, identifying potential investment opportunities, conducting diligence on those investment opportunities. Uh, through the course of his three years with us, he got to speak with certainly hundreds, if not thousands of growth stage businesses. And that was enough to pique his interest that he wanted to see the inside of a growth stage company. He moved on, he joined Black Duck Software, terrific company. Again, a local local business uh, to Boston that was ultimately acquired by Synopsys. Uh, and he has now for the last four years uh, been at Thought Industries uh, where he is VP of Revenue Operations. So I'm, I'm excited uh, for today's conversation for a couple of reasons. I, th I think there's a couple of threads we can pull on here. One, I want to get into your career progression and discernment process, Peter, as you moved from investment bank to invest to investing firm uh, to now being inside, you know, a growth stage uh, software business. Also, want to talk a little bit about revenue operations. I mentioned your 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 VP of revenue operations. Some people might be saying, "What the heck is revenue operations?" Um, in our role at Volition, certainly as software investors, we're very familiar with what that means and the impact it can have on a business as it looks to professionalize the internal operations and really position a company to scale. But we are lucky to have an expert in our presence today. So I really want to you know, kind of hear about it from your perspective. So maybe just to kick things off, Peter, I gave a little bit of an intro but I'm sure our listeners would love to understand a little bit more about kind of your background and your career journey. We interview so many people. I mentioned you were an analyst at Volition. I meet with a lot of young people. They ask for career advice. If I do this, what does that mean for the next 15 years? Obviously, there's lots of uh, open questions as you progress through your career. Um, but I think you're an example of someone who's navigated it in a really interesting way to find a role where you can really leverage your experiences and have impact. So uh, maybe maybe kick it off there, Peter, and, and give a little more on your background. Great. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate the introduction and thank you for having me on. I'm delighted to be kicking off season three here. Uh, and great. Big, to, there was a long list of potential candidates, by the way, for the first I, uh, first guest of season three, Peter. I, I know, I know. And a, and a chance to be on uh, you know, the podcast of a guy that I consider a mentor is, is, uh, is really great. So thank you. Uh, yeah. So, um, coming out of, of, you know, liberal arts background, uh, I didn't really know how to do anything, you know, specifically, uh, but I got a great background in, uh, math and in economics and in being able to make data tell a story. And really, uh, that's what I was doing, you know, in my, my time, uh, you know, cup of coffee at an investment bank right out of school. And then in my time at Volition, uh, as you mentioned, it was about having conversations with uh, CEOs, executives at fast growing, exciting companies. And then uh, on a lot of them, getting a chance to dig in on the numbers and try to tell the story of the business through uh, the numbers. And, you know, the goal there was really to decide whether or not you know, any given business was going to be a fit for volition for, for what, uh, for the profile and the, the characteristics we were looking for. Um, uh, but also, you know, it had, as you alluded to, it had the, the knock on effect of just having this unbelievable opportunity to talk with, I think I tallied it up, uh, a, almost a thousand different CEOs at all these different companies, whether or not they were a fit for Volition, they all had an amazing story to tell. 
because they were growing fast. They were in a many of them in a new market, uh, but but you know if, if not a new market, at least with a brand new take on an existing market. Um, really inspiring stories and 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 businesses. And so yeah, as a as a from the investor standpoint. You get to go, uh, you know, fairly deep into a, a lot of companies. But I found, you know, after three and a half years of, of working at Volition, I had this this kind of nagging feeling that I wanted to go deeper and learn more about what it is to run one of these exciting growth stage software businesses. So that's when you know you and I had a conversation, and and I, you know, I I explain that to you. And uh, you said, well, just so happens, uh, you know, there's this, there's this amazing business called Black Duck Software that, that, you know, was a, a volition portfolio company and uh, some incredible people there that you put me in touch with. So that was really what, what sparked the, the jump from the investing side to the operating side. And, um, Pete, when you made that decision and you were kind of doing that introspection about, boy, maybe I want to go to an operating company. I'm sure there was a part of you that was going through the thought process of like, okay, that's step one. But like step two is like, what am I going to do inside an operating company? And for people who are earlier in their careers and they're trying to leverage what they have done and apply it in a new context. How did you navigate that path into, I, I think the group was called business operations. The common thread was really an ability to make data tell a story. That is valuable, whether you're an investor or whether you're inside a business trying to help folks around the business make great decisions. So I had that skill set. I didn't know anything about Salesforce. I didn't know anything about marketing ops, about uh, territory planning, about forecasting. I didn't know anything about the specifics of those disciplines that uh, are the purview of an op of a revenue operations team. But I had the data skills, and so I was going to be valuable off the bat. And I had this perspective of talking with a whole bunch of different operators across different industries that allowed me to really interpret you know, what was going on at the business. And you know, it was a crash course in uh, learning all those other things once I jumped into, into that business. But really, that, the common thread is being able to analyze data. And if you can do that, you're going to be valuable inside a, a growing software business. OK, so your title today is VP Revenue Operations. What is revenue operations? Yeah, so I, there's it, it's kind of a common thing on a whole bunch of podcasts. Revenue operations is hot right now. Everyone comes on and gives their definition of what revenue operations is. I'm going to be very tactical. Revenue operations is a group of people at a business that is responsible for connecting silos. At the highest level, that's what we're doing. We at Thought Industries, what that looks like is we have a sales operations discipline within revenue operations. We have marketing operations. We have CS operations. And then we have an analyst overlay and a systems overlay. So that team is going around the business, helping to create process, helping to use technology in a productive way, and helping to analyze and draw insights out of the business in order to make the whole go-to-market operation operate more efficiently, more effectively, more efficiently. And at what stage of a company do you think it makes sense to formalize the revenue operations function and process? As you well know, Peter, you know, our portfolio companies have gotten to a certain level of scale. They've usually done it in a under-resourced manner. There are a number of people wearing multiple hats throughout the organization, but they raise capital because they recognize, wow, there's this big market opportunity out there. There's prioritization, and I think there's a sequencing of investments. From your perspective and what you've seen, what do you think is the right scale where executives should start to think about formalizing this process? 
Yeah, it's when your person who's running finance says that they're going to quit unless you hire someone to help them with the data. Uh, no, that that's tongue in cheek, but but uh, it may be may be truthful too. It it's really when you get to the scale where you need to start dropping in uh, business functions and both leaders and frontline folks around the company, and you need to drop them into something that is already established that doesn't require them to be a, uh, a, a diamond in the rough type hire in order to be successful. So every business that gets to that you know, five to 25 million in revenue, especially if they're bootstrapping and, and um, you know, uh, growing quickly, you have some really special people in place. You probably have a VP of sales that is a is exceptional operator. You probably have a marketing person that is, again, like diamond in the rough type person. You've gotten a bunch of hires really, really right to get there. But in order to scale to 30, 50, 100 and beyond, you're not going to be able to hire diamond in the rough people all across the business. You're going to need to establish great process that you can plug a wide range of folks into. So maybe bring that bring that to life a little bit. Like what is the output of a revenue operations team and what maybe just give some tangible examples about like what are those processes and outputs that can help drive scale across the organization and support some of these types of executives you're referring to? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll use uh, kind of a classic example first, and then I'll talk through some non-obvious stuff as well that we've worked on. So the straight down the pipe classic example is forecasting. So you may early on in a business, you may have a VP of sales, a CFO, a CEO, uh, maybe a, a one or two frontline sales managers that all are like they're they're like amazing athletes. They're like amazing. They're all Wayne Gretzky. They can all anticipate where the puck's going to be. They speak their own language and they can forecast any given quarter down to you know a couple thousand bucks. Over time, though, they're going to be managing more and more people, more and more frontline sales managers. You need to establish great forecast process that rolls all the way up from the individual rep sitting in a chair with their own individual quota all the way up to what you're presenting to the board in that board meeting uh, and that you know your CEO is staking his or her reputation on. Um, so one of the things that we've done uh, currently at, at my company is uh, we've kind of taken a step back uh, on the art side of forecasting. Forecasting is part art, part science. As we've scaled, we've recognized that, hey, you know what, we're going to take a step back for a moment, remove some of the art, make it much more science, make it much more data driven, and take a little more of the uh, uh, manager intuition uh, kind of feel piece out of it and see if we can drive really accurate forecasts uh, uh, from that perspective. And then, you know, to get it down to the Pennies, we're going to add back in more art, uh, you know, as we as we get there. But uh, right now, we need that scalable, processized science piece of of forecasting. So that's one of the things that we've. And done. I suspect a lot of that, Pete, relies on kind of consistent usage and treatment of how you interact with the CRM tool of choice for that organization. Is that fair? Hundred percent. Yeah. It it it's. Uh, Salesforce centric for us, we do not layer on fancy forecasting tools at this point. Uh, we are all about back to basics. Uh, it's it's the tool, it's the defining of what the forecast categories are, what they mean, what's the interaction between forecast, close date, size of the deal, um, and it's also really importantly uh, cadence. So uh, week to week, we have the exact same cadence every week. Monday, frontline reps and frontline managers get together and go through individual uh, uh, forecasts. On Tuesdays, the managers and my RevOps team get together, talk through it, make any adjustments we need to make. And then on Wednesdays, we roll it up to our president and our CEO. And then later that Wednesday, if it's a board meeting Wednesday, they walk it into the board. And every single week, we don't have a board meeting every week, but 
every yep. single week, we do every one of those other steps so that it's consistent. Everyone knows what to expect. Uh, they know the definition. They know where it takes place and they know the cadence. So maybe let's like dig a little deeper. I'm on a bunch of boards, as you know, and I think uh, companies vary in the level of precision of their forecasting and the likelihood that they're going to hit their forecast or even land close to that forecast. Any like tips of the trade that you've observed on things a company should do, whether it be tactically or organizationally, to kind of hone in and further refine that forecasting process to provide visibility to constituents, uh, whether inside or outside the company? Yeah, so uh, you absolutely need to decide on uh, two things. First, the one view that if anyone has a question about what the forecast is, that they know they can go to that one view and always get the real-time forecast, single source of truth for that thing. And make sure that everyone who has a stake in forecasting has the ability to click that link and find that one view. That will remove uh, uncertainty, it'll remove, remove confusion, remove headaches for your VP of sales, for your president, your CRO, and for your RevOps team too, which is great. Um, and then also really double down on the definitions and reinforce the definitions. Everyone at everyone in this for forecasting the new business side of the house, everyone in the sales team needs to be able to answer the question, like, what is the definition of any one of our sales, any one of our forecast yep. categories? Yep. Same. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Cause that does even tend to vary it, as I just reflect on our portfolio companies. And sometimes there's subjectivity about what classification it, it falls into. So then inevitably you have the sales force, the individual sales reps will roll up their forecast and it's X, you know, then the managers get involved and it usually gets haircut down to like 0.8 X. Then the VP gets involved with the CRO and it's like 0.6 X, but I'm not sure how much science is involved in that process. Again, I think it varies from company to company. Now, have you, you mentioned like when you joined Black Dog, uh, I'm sure you got familiar with it now in thought industry, you know, kind of heading up as, as VP of, of revenue operations. Have you become like a Salesforce ninja or are there, or are there people on your team that handle that and then manage like the education across the organization of how you're going to treat this and manage the process? I personally got very deep into the nitty gritty uh, right after leaving Volition when I first joined Black Duck. And yep. um, I I never was Salesforce certified. Um, I've never even looked at that test. Uh, but I got to the point where there was really nothing the business would ask of me that I wouldn't be able to do myself if I if I needed. Yep. yep. Since then, my skills have uh, regressed. Yeah. Uh, so, so we've had we've been lucky enough to be able to hire folks that way outstrip anywhere I could ever uh, uh, have gotten to uh, in, as far as working technically in in our tools, including Salesforce. And uh, uh, yeah, th th those folks do such a good job. It's I will say uh, in revenue operations, being a leader in revenue operations. There will still be times when you have to go into some flow that's been built in Salesforce, crack it open, look at the little individual, you know, if then uh, uh, piece of the flow, ensure that some definition is being applied in the right way and that the data is going to run through it the right way. You still need to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that. You know, I'm not I'm not building the flow anymore. Thank goodness, because again, we've got people that are so much better than me at that. I mean, it sounds like you're you know fairly invested in Salesforce, but we can't have this little discussion thread without me giving a plug to a Volition portfolio company, Creatio, which is built on a no code composable framework that enables business users to make some of those modifications without. Uh, you know, kind of having a, a PhD in programming. Uh, side note for other folks that are looking to build out their CRM going forward for high growth companies. Um, but as I, back to the category, Pete, like as I think about, it could be Volition, it could be a portfolio company. 
there's like a progression of how organizations interact with their CRM. And as a result, it's like the benefit and leverage you can get from that platform. Early on, it's just like, hey, everyone log your interactions in Salesforce. That's like step one, getting everyone bought in. You know, if that's step one, it sounds like you're on step 100 um, of that journey. Can you just talk about like some of the pitfalls along the way and the challenges that organizations inevitably will encounter of going from like, hey, this is our source of truth. Everyone use it to the end point of like, wow, we got this thing running to the point where we can really accurately forecast the business and as a result, leverage that intelligence to make strategic decisions. Yeah, it it, it is a process. You, you cannot skip a single step in that process that you just that you just alluded to. Uh, it you can never take your eye off the ball as far as data quality and data cleanliness goes in the CRM. And you really, you know, this is a this is a plug for having a, a you know sophisticated revenue operations function. But you need someone who's seeing the big picture from a very early stage, because I know there'll be people listening to this that have gone through the pain of having to refactor a CRM, or if you've ever combined two businesses and tried to marry together two CRMs with different levels of data, different schema, it is so important to have the right schema in mind early on in the business so that you're generating high quality data as soon as possible. Because, you know, even beyond forecasting, being able to quickly pull metrics to make decisions, that's that's what this is all about. So, you know, I, I've, I've been in situations, I've been at, you know, companies where it's really hard to answer basic questions. Like, mm -hmm. how many customers do we have? Seems like such a basic question, but to get there, it actually takes a lot of correct setup correct process that is feeding in the right data in the right way at the right time into Salesforce or whatever your, your, your CRM is. Um, and, and then obviously the, the, the folks to interpret it. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a process that's really, that's really the, the tactical side doing all that setup is really the tactical side of revenue mm -hmm. operations. And every once in a while, something will happen. There'll be a glitch. There'll be There'll be uh, someone enters the wrong data or breaks something in some way. Any strategic rev ops thing we have on our plate goes on the back burner and we go back to the basics and we solve for that core data that you need in order to run the business. Yep. So it sounds like I'm extrapolating from some of the points you've made, but is it fair to say that the more data the easier it is to further refine and layer in science to a forecasting process. Forecasting, certainly. Yeah. yeah. It, and and uh, the historical data is really important too. This is yeah. something that that we did early on. Um, the, the time series, having time series data. So, you know, every 13 week quarter, knowing where you were on week one, two, three, four, and where you ended up on week 13, going back through time is so important. Having that data over many quarters looking backwards, being able to look at that and, and then apply that to any, you know, the current quarter, so helpful in determining uh, whether or not you're going to hit your number. I'm like thinking about some of our portfolio companies, Pete, right? Because like, it's not uncommon that a company in its early days could, you know, maybe you have five, six, eight salespeople, but you have one or two moving the needle and driving all the sales. Now, the goal, if you really want to scale the organization, is you want to spread out that productivity across a broader base. But it might be hard in those early days when you have three or four sales reps to look at historical data and really draw any conclusions from it. So I could imagine a lot of this is probably a journey. Like our mutual friend, Pete Lampson, who's the CEO of Employ, which is a parent company that includes former Volition portfolio company, Jazz HR. Like he always used to say, and I'm sure still does, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So I would imagine a lot of this is at least like creating the baseline 
early on in a company's progression so that you can start measuring progress against that. Absolutely. You need to have someone who has the big picture in mind. And when I say big picture, it's also the three, four or five years down the road picture in mind early on at the business. So you can yeah. start running the business, collecting the data, building the process that you know you're going to need in three years and five years. Like, do you, you think got- an $8 million revenue business with four salespeople could benefit from revenue operations? I, I do. I do. Yeah. And what I, would be those like early steps that they should take? Yeah. So if you're hiring your first person to do revenue operations, first, depending on the business, they are either going to be biased towards sales or biased towards marketing. Mm -hmm. If you're heavily marketing driven, if you're transactional, uh, uh, if the vast majority of your business comes in the door then you're going to have someone who's more marketing oriented. They're going to be focused on setting up campaign operations, marketing intelligence, making sure that you're tracking spend really well. Those 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 sorts of things right off the bat. Um, in my experience, I've I've worked in businesses that are much more sales biased uh, in their growth. Uh, growth you know, growth is much more closely tied to adding headcount, putting more quota on the street. Um, having folks doing both inbound and outbound. The first thing that I've done when I've been an early hire has been to read every customer contract. (laughs) You're going to hire someone who's going to come in. They're going to look at your CRM and they're going to say, ooh, uh, this is not what we need. Uh, We do not have what we need uh, when we're looking ahead three, four, five years from now. And they're going to establish that base level of customer data that you need to be able to tell, hey, who are our customers, where we've been successful in the past, um, you know, also who's renewing, uh, who's who's coming up for renewal, who we need, who do we need to make sure um, continues with us. Um, that person is going to dig through paper contracts or PDFs or whatever you have, and they're going to get all that data set up in Salesforce. And then from there, we're going to tackle, you know, all the new stuff that's coming in the door. So then you start layering on. Uh, sales process and reflecting sales process in your CRM. So what happens when you have a person who walks in the door and requests a demo? What happens when that that turns into a real opportunity? What happens when you start doing demos, trials, negotiating, et cetera? How does that all get reflected in the CRM? And then you start to build the data from there. Those are really the two core things. Lock now, are there in- any, are there like, resource, you know, this whole category of revenue operations, you mentioned it earlier. It's a hot topic. I think it's an area a lot of companies are investing in trying to refine their process again, in the spirit of trying to drive good, actionable intelligence. Are there any places you go external? I'm sure you work with lots of super smart, sharp people who you leverage day to day, but, you know, are there resources you leverage almost like how to guides out there on how to set up the organization and take those initial steps? I have been a huge consumer of podcasts, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is so much good content out there where operators, you know, RevOps folks, but also, you know, uh, sales leaders, marketing leaders, consultants um, that are out there talking uh, in like pretty tactical terms about what it is that they're doing at their businesses. Yep. Um, I would also say, you know, there are a lot of consultants out there in this field, a ton, and they, many of them produce amazing content that again, gets into like the tactical stuff that you actually yep. need in order to stand up uh, you know, revenue operations and like sales and marketing process and CS process in general. Um, so I've loved podcasts. Don't worry, I'm not going to promote anyone else's podcast. on. Yeah, no, podcast. all good. I'm, I'm a big consumer of podcasts as well. <laughs> Uh, it's been a great source. You know, I'm like, while I'm eating breakfast, while I'm, you know, cleaning out my inbox on any given morning, I I generally have a podcast uh, and going in the background. And so often there's something that I hear that's like, oh, we can apply that, you know, to yep. something we're working on right now. 
Yeah. I do think like, I'm sure you saw this and observed it from those thousand plus companies you talked to at Volition. There are companies that are data-driven and there are companies that are not data-driven. Uh, and you can get by early on. If you have like a good product market fit and there's a lot of demand for what you're selling, you can get by perhaps with a less data-driven approach. But as you mature, um, gravity starts to set in and you have to become more data intensive to really break through and continue to scale um, at, at an aggressive rate. So certainly from my perspective, this is a necessary step. For all those companies that have gotten to $10 million and they're so psyched, oh my gosh, all our dreams have been achieved. We went from zero to 10. That's an amazing accomplishment and very few companies get there. But to get to 100, you're going to have to continue to refine your approach and really leverage data in every imaginable way um, to kind of maintain that trajectory. I guess to that point, Pete, like how big of an investment is this? Just like organizationally, I'm sure there's a cultural element uh, that needs to be driven from the top down that you're a data-driven organization. But um, if you were talking to an entrepreneur who is at that $10 million revenue point and knows they have to start refining their approach and professionalizing and becoming more data driven. How big of an investment is this, at least in the in the earlier stages? You know, the, the investment is almost entirely just headcount. Um, we have my team has one or two you know, tools that we use. Mm -hmm. uh, really, it's 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 headcount expense. Um, and at that, you know, $10 million stage, you, you really need just one person to start getting the function off the ground. And I'm guessing that person is like, needs to be pretty cross-functional. That person needs to be cross-functional and depending on, you know, whether you're a marketing biased go-to-market operation or a sales biased one, you need to have the, the right, you know, experience, uh, um, at least in, in that discipline. Um, but you really, uh, you can make a lot of hay with, with one hire, uh, uh, you know, in that size business. And, you know, you can, there's folks that have got, you know, like ratios and, and like, you need this many ops people, if you've got this big of a marketing team or this big a sale and, and those are, those are great. Um, but, uh, it, it should, it's different business to business. It can be so different business to business based on who you have. Uh, out there in the business as managers. So if you have a bunch of managers that are very process oriented and uh, uh, disciplined about reinforcing process amongst their their teams, you may not need as many uh, folks on the revenue operations team. Yep. Um, but if 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 you have folks that are you know all about you know on the sales team, if you've got folks that are um, you know, they're great at forecasting, they're great at running deals, they're great at doing deal reviews and great at doing one-on-ones. Uh, but, you know, they don't really want to think about how we're defining any of this stuff. They don't want to think about, you know, how we uh, uh, you know, define all the stages of the sales process, for example. Then like, you're going to need a really strong sales operations person on your RevOps team in order to work with those folks and get that get that process in place. And who who are your constituents? Pete, like in your organization, like who relies on revenue operations and the output of all your hard work? Yeah. So at the highest levels, three different teams, the marketing team, the sales team, and then the we call it customer experience team, which, okay. which, which includes customer success, support, and professional services. So those are our, our three functional groups that we work with most closely. And uh there are members of the revenue operations team that we have working hand in hand with the leaders of those groups. Um, so as I said, the way that we're structured is you know, we've got marketing ops function, we've got sales ops function, we've got CS ops function. And those folks on the, on the revenue operations team, they are the strategic partner to the heads of those functional groups uh, out in the business at, at Thought Industries. Hey, Pete, so one one topic I just want to circle back to, you mentioned like when you're standing up a revenue operations function, there are some tools you use. Um, I'd love to understand what those are a little bit more. And, you know, you can't listen to a podcast or, or, or uh, read a news column without some mention of artificial intelligence and generative AI. And I'd love to know if you have figured out any ways 
to leverage some of those new emerging uh, data tools available in the market in order to really kind of automate some of your workflows. Yeah, absolutely. One of the one of the most critical things that we do in our go to market operation is decide which accounts to go pursue. It seems like a very basic thing. And when you're a small, fast growing company, you've probably got people in the business that just know. They know that account X is a better time for better place for them to spend time than account Y. So they're going to reach out to account X. But as you scale, doing great account selection becomes a harder thing to do because you're going to hire someone new off the street. You want them to get ramped quickly as possible, but they don't have all the institutional knowledge that that salesperson you've had since day one has in order in trying to decide which accounts to go after. Mm -hmm. So we've actually spent a bunch of time on this, um, building out an account scoring model, and we use generative AI in that model to do some of the work that an experienced rep or someone, you know, a group of interns or whoever you may hire to like cleanse a list would be doing. Uh, this is one of the things that we saw really early on, you know, last year when ChatGPT was coming out, we started playing around with it. This is one of the things that we identified looked really promising. So we actually use a tool called Clay. Um, it's an incredible, it does so many different things. It's hard to even explain what it is, but it's most often used to do list cleansing, uh, uh, lead gen, and mm -hmm. contact and account research. So we load in a whole list of accounts that uh, we think are potential fit for the types of companies that we would sell to. Um, we've already done some firmographic screening on them. So like revenue size, industry, but there are still things that make accounts a better fit than others for us. So we program in a question into our into the generative AI engine that you can wire up to Clay. And we say, hey, go look at the website and answer these specific questions. So for us, we're all about selling to companies that do customer training or do professional training. So we ask it questions to determine whether they're doing that and getting at how sophisticated they are doing that. And depending on the answer, we apply a score for every single account. So we've rolled out, we're at, we, we use a named account territory model. So we've rolled out this generative AI powered scoring as a part of that model to try to stack the deck for our reps. When they get their territory, we've already done some of that research that, as I said, an experienced rep would just be able to know, but just by looking at an account's website, um, or that you'd hire someone to do a list cleanse in order to accomplish. Got it. Wow, that does sound powerful. So I would imagine there's an element of your job where you're always kind of keeping your eye on the horizon for tools that the organization could leverage to drive efficiency, shorten sales cycle, make sales resource time more productive. Uh, Clay, all right, I'll have to take a look at that one. Interesting. Uh, Peter, this conversation has been amazing. I've definitely learned some new things. Uh, I'm going to follow up with you on a few topics offline to go a little deeper on some of these points that I think our portfolio uh, companies could benefit from. I've also enjoyed this conversation because it's just good to catch up with you. We talked about the fact you used to work at Volition. I had my eye on you right from the beginning. I knew you were going to go on and do big things. I envision that taking a variety of different forms. There's part of me that could see you being Senator Peter Jennings at some point. I still haven't entirely ruled that out. I know you could also go out there and someday I fully expect you to, to be running big companies and, and uh, putting into, into practice everything you've learned along the way and, and all the many things you're, you're going to, to learn down the road. Thank you, Sean. I really appreciate the chance to chat with you and Thank you for uh, all of your guidance uh, along the way, along my career journey. So uh, thanks very much for having me.